Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Uh, I have this privilege, again, you and I can sit down and listen to someone talk about how the Holy Spirit uh, touched his heart, opened him to a deeper walk with Jesus Christ and his church. And uh, I'm excited and privileged to have as a guest tonight not only a, a, a former Journey Home guest that's been on here almost more times than I have, but, uh, <laughs> but a good friend, Dr. Paul Thigpen. Good to have you back, Marcus, Paul. Thank you, friend, man. former thank evangelical you. Pentecostal minister. And uh, you told me something just a second ago, just before we went on, that uh, I've been ask, asking you if you've been writing lately and you, what, you just finished your 50th book. That's right. Got a couple more on the horizon, too. That's great. That, that really is good. In fact, uh, one of the reasons that I asked Paul to come back uh, at this time is... Uh, Paul's a prolific writer and has written on many issues about our faith. And I don't think any of us watching this program, whether you're watching it now when it's first aired or whether in the future, uh, is oblivious to the fact that the church right now is going through a difficult time. We, we can't avoid that. Uh, there's a scandal. Um, and for many of us, it's disheartening, to say the least, um, uh, disgusting, some might say, uh, discouraging, especially as I am the parent of a, of a seminarian. Uh, so anyway, I, I don't need to go into detail all the stuff that we've, it's, it's there on the internet, it's everywhere. But I, I wanted to invite some guests back to the journey home that could address not the issues as if we're a news report, because we aren't. This program is about conversion. It's about a deeper walk with Jesus Christ, drawn to his church, and looking at life through the eyes of the church, which is what we believe is why we're Catholics, is that our Lord established this church. And so when we see problems in the church, one of the questions is, how do we respond? How do we respond to that in terms of conversion, how do we talk to those outside the church about it? How do we talk to those in the church that are deeply, deeply, deeply hurt and discouraged and want to leave? But before we get there, some of the audience may not have heard your story. So that's what we're going to get to. And, and partially is because Paul has written three books, which we're going to talk about after the break, I assume, that deal with issues that all are connected to our present uh, struggle. All right. But before we get there, why don't we talk a little bit about your journey? You've, you, you've given the whole thing on, on the journey home before, but remind the audience in case, and I'll shut up. <laughs> well, thank you, Marcus. I, I like to tell people I'm a, a walking ecumenical movement. I was born into a family uh, that was Lutheran at the time. I was not baptized until we belonged to a Presbyterian church. I became a, a, an atheist at, at age 12. Mm -hmm. For six years, all the way through junior high, senior high, was uh, was an atheist. Had a, a dramatic conversion uh, back to the Christian faith when I was eighteen, and um, after that, then in a series of evangelical Protestant backgrounds, was either a member of or associated with, um, in addition to Lutherans and Presbyterians, Baptists, Episcopalians, Methodists, Assemblies of God, two different kinds of non-denominational um, churches, and. Uh, very restless because I hadn't found home. Yeah. And uh, was this while you were studying in school, or, or while you were working, that you were visiting all these different churches? Right? Well, I, mean, I was actually part of. It. I was a, a you know youth pastor for okay, a Baptist so church for once. I was a, taught a Sunday school at an Episcopal church. We belonged to the Methodist church for a while. We belonged to the Assemblies okay. of God. So I actually associated. This is with while you were in ministry. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, yes, yeah. of yeah. different, different okay. kinds, gotcha. and then gotcha. finally uh, ordained in a church in Atlanta, and. Uh, what I guess began to set me on the road toward the Catholic Church was when I decided to do a doctoral program in church history, mm -hmm. historical theology. And we all know that to be deep in history, yeah. what happens. And uh, other things were going on. I was uh, meeting Catholic folks that were <clears throat> impressing me with their faith and their knowledge and their, their depth. Um, and I was uh, beginning to, as I was reading, for instance, St. Augustine in my, my classes, I would find myself talking to him, <laughs> then I would stop and say, 
wait, I'm not supposed to be praying to saints. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> but uh, I still remember one day when I was reading uh, St. Augustine's essay against the Donatists. They were uh, the people of their day who kind of had decided the Catholic Church wasn't pure enough, and they broke away. They, they're the ones that instead group. of using a, a wafer, used donuts, right? Is that where that name came from? <laughs> the Donatists. <laughs> So no, they, no, but anyway, yeah, great. yeah. But uh, so I, I remember reading that, and he was talking about all these, making all these points about why they shouldn't do that. And I am saying, yeah, you tell him, Augusta. That's right. Get him. You, you tell him. You tell him. This is the fourth century, and then all of a sudden, I put the book down. I said, oh my goodness, I am a Donatist. <laughs> I am a twentieth century Donatist uh, for all these reasons that they've given for being separated from this church that yeah. goes back to the apostles. And that, that was enlightening, and all kinds of, you know. It was in that stuff. letter to the Donatists that, I think, that Augustine makes one of his strongest statements, which is, it doesn't matter uh, how heretical your leaders might get. It's never a reason for schism. Yes, yes. I think it was something like that yes. that he said to the Donatists. And no matter so, how bad the leadership gets, it never justifies yeah. schism. Yeah. So that, uh, I took a course on the mystics, St. Catherine, Sieta, I began to read the dialogues, which also showed me <laughs> all kinds of things going on in her time, the Middle Ages, and, um, but slowly began to be convinced that this would be home for me because this is the yeah. church that Jesus founded through the apostles. Yeah. And no matter what might come up, uh, I would be like Peter saying, where else do we have to go, Lord? Yeah. And uh, took a... Uh, my wife wasn't quite at the same place while I had the was spending all my day reading these church fathers, especially at others in my <laughs> program. She was taking care of the kids and homeschool and then all these other things and didn't have the leisure. But uh, eventually she did come to the same same conviction. We came into the church. It's been 25 years this that's, year. This Easter right. was our silver anniversary. And I always tell people it's the best decision I ever made, except for marrying my wife. That's the, <laughs> that's the best. Now, I can't remember... Because you came into year after I did, but and we were going through similar things. Uh, but you were at the first meeting of the Coming Home Network mm -hmm. way back in '93, so you've been associated with our work all along. You've even worked for us for a while, and we're on the board for a while. And um, but I'm trying to remember if you were faced with part of that decision about coming into the church. What are you going to do now with your family? Mm -hmm. Whether you're you know, supporting your family. Was that part of the issue for you when you had to, to jump ship and become Catholic? Uh, when I began to see that things were headed that way, uh, uh, the Lord opened a door for me to uh, to go into to Christian publishing. And so, because uh, I've been writing and, and freelance editing and things for years. So um, it's not like I got up in my church one day and announced that this is going to happen. I, I moved from there. And a lot of sadness. It had been a wonderful place. I still love those people dearly. Um, but I was able to move into a, a, a publishing setting. Now, uh, eventually that became complicated because the, the, when I went full-time freelance, um, pretty much all but one of my publishers, when they found out I was becoming Catholic, did not want to use me, my services anymore. Hmm. Uh, but the Lord made a way, and He always has. I remember the long story of one of the books that you had published, had written and published, uh, had been published by a non-Catholic publisher, and you wanted to get permission to bring that book and update it, revise it for a Catholic world, and and they wouldn't let go of it, right? <laughs> yes, and, uh, it's that was, that's another long story. But anyway, it's yeah. uh, it was it was complicated. I, I I didn't face nearly what many people do uh, when they're making that decision, and they know that nothing but pastoral ministry, and they won't be able to continue that. Um, I did have. And, and because of my doctoral degree, was able eventually to, you know, to go into teaching and, right. and serve on the theolo theology faculty. Right, right. Um, you dipped your toe in a lot of different Christian traditions over the years. So when you come into the Catholic Church, I'm wondering uh, which of the teachings of the church, the, 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 thing, the, the pillars of the church, was particularly important to you that brought you into the church and which of them was maybe the, the biggest to get over in becoming Catholic? Mm. They, some of them may have been the same. <laughs> they, oh. So, uh, yeah, for instance, it, it of course took me some time to begin to understand Our Lady, mm -hmm. and uh, as that would be for, for many folks. But once I understood 
then it became one of the things most attractive, most beautiful to me. Um, kind of sweetness I've, I've said in other settings that that I, I began to associate with everything that involved her that was a lot like my mother in the same way a very saintly woman but to begin to see her as, as my mother and uh, she's she's certainly been one of the bulwarks for me in remaining Catholic um, Sola Scriptura that whole issue yeah. of trying to understand tradition but once I understood it then it made perfect sense and that's that's became a major part of how I understood God's revelation of himself to us. I know a lot of those churches that you mentioned, uh, their history is partially uh, driven by almost an anti-sacramental commitment that some of these non-Catholic Christian traditions have so rejected the idea of sacraments that they're anti-sacraments. We don't need sacraments. The sacraments don't deliver any graces. There's nothing special there in baptism or the Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. They're just, just memorials. Just they're yeah. just symbols. I mean, almost vehemently uh, look on sacramental life as a complete work of the devil uh, in the churches. Mm -hmm. uh, so you were in some of those traditions. And then you look at the Catholic Church where... I mean, we don't just say that the sacraments are uh, just one of many ways. The church, in this age of the church, we recognize, no, the sacraments are the primary way that we receive the graces of Christ. Talk about that transition for you. Well, it's interesting. I actually, um, I presented a paper one time at the American Academy of Religion, which is like the, the you know, big academy in the, in the academic world for uh, religious scholars. On, on what I call uh, Pentecostals and, and the sacramental religious imagination. And my experience, and I've seen it with others, is that uh, within the Pentecostal experience, which you know has its roots in Scripture, they, they would see things in Scripture yeah. and say, oh, that's okay, um, that they are, their, their way of looking at things, at religious matters, the, the deeper you go into the Pentecostal experience, the more you begin to your imagination, your way of seeing things begins to be more sacramental. Hmm. And uh, so that's why, for instance, one of the first things, uh, when I began to realize that, um, and I experienced healing miracles, saw them, that kind of thing. And back in the 70s, you know, when I became Christian, the, the mainline Protestant churches did not accept that. The miracles, like Luther said, you know, stopped with the early church. But and so I was saying, but doesn't anybody, you know, still believe in this? In addition to Pentecostals, I found, guess what? The Catholics are on the same side of that <laughs> debate as the Pentecostals are. And almost nobody was doing exorcisms, I thought, outside the Pentecostal church, and then I realized the Catholic church was still doing that. And it was the Catholic church that said, as Pentecostals did, that body postures are important in worship. It's not just from the head up. And... Uh, what they what they called pageantry, but it's a lot like the Catholic notion of, I mean, they have processions and yeah. things like vestments. Uh, I mean, some Pentecostals were even use the holy water, you know. And I began to say, there's something going on here. All these things that through my experience as a Pentecostal I've come to see is kind of imitating, reflecting, echoing things that the Catholics say and do, believe. Which so, is the Holy Spirit yes, working yeah. in the lives of people that are asking God, Lord, we, we, we want you. We, we want to be intimate with you. And we, the Lord responds. So C.S. Lewis once said that before his conversion, reading George MacDonald had, had uh, how do you put it, baptized his imagination. And I like to say that the Pentecostal movement sacramentalized my imagination. Hmm. And I began to realize that uh, unlike some of the traditions I've been raised in, uh, it said that the body is important, that the words can have a certain power that God gives them, a divine power. Postures are important, all those things. Uh, and miracles, and, and I mean, they even had things like relics without realizing it, <laughs> right. that all those things are. are Our guest is Dr. Paul Thigpen. What about another aspect that's radically different in the Catholic Church than almost every other Christian tradition, and that's uh, recognizing the importance of sacrifice hmm. in worship. Uh, the, in other words, the priest is not merely another preacher. He is a priest. There's a sacrifice. And uh, I mean, talk about history, the historical theology of sacrifice hmm. in, in uh, liturgy. Was that something that awakened you to the church? Well, yes. You know, reading 
St. Ignatius of Antioch, just who would have been trained by the apostles almost certainly, and to hear him saying, what's on the altar is the very same body, the same flesh that was on the cross. And I thought, oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> this is not some later development. This man who received his faith from the apostles is insisting on that. And even talks about a few people who refused to believe it and left. Yeah. And I'm thinking here again, I'm seeing, you know, it's, it's history's repeated itself. So once, once I, I, I came to the conclusion, to the conviction, that the Eucharist was truly the body and blood of, of Christ before I ever became Catholic, but that it was only that way, the Catholic and, of course, Orthodox setting. And once, that's really was such an important part of my conversion. Once I was convinced of that, I had to have it. I had to have the body and blood of Christ. And so it was a matter of saying, Lord, how do I, how do I get to it now? Yeah. yeah. All right. You've been a Catholic now for 25 years, right? And you're celebrating that anniversary. Uh, as you look back over the years, have you learned a few new things uh, as a Catholic that have confirmed your decision that this was indeed the church that God had called you home to? Well, I've, uh, I've seen again and again, um, for instance, the, the power of confession, sacramental confession. In the beginning, I did it out of obedience. The church says we need to do this. And, and I did experience right away, you know, great freedom. But uh, over the years, that awareness, that transformation that it brings, the power of the mm -hmm. grace that it brings, has confirmed for me again and again, yes, mm -hmm. yes, this, this is true. Um, my, uh, the same with the Eucharist, the way it has changed my life. I, I try to, I don't make it to Mass every day, but almost. Um, interestingly enough, uh, you know, I've written a book called Spirit, Manual for Spiritual Warfare and a book about right. Saints and Battle Satan, some of that. Um, recall how in the Gospel there were times when, say, the Sadducees and Pharisees were not believing Jesus, that he was who he claimed to be. And then the demons in an exorcism, when he cast them out, would actually be the ones to give testimony that they wouldn't get and say, you son of God, you know, what, do you, don't come after, after us before the day of, of judgment comes. And the more I've learned talking to exorcists and others, how I've seen a similar kind of, you might say, demonic testimony, that the, the mm -hmm. demons, through what they say, testify to the reality of certain Catholic teachings, so that mm -hmm. for some exorcists, one of the, the tests to give to someone who they think may be possessed to see if they are if there's something spiritual going on or if it's just you know mental is to put before them several identical metals holy metals only one of which is blessed and say what do you what do you think of those and speaking through the victim if it is something satanic it'll without the person having natural knowledge point to the ones that aren't blessed and say just a piece of metal that's nothing that's nothing but then we'll always point to the one Wow. that's blessed, and say, that burns. Get it away from me. Hmm. So for people who might think the whole notion of sacramentals and, and there being power there, to think that's just all superstition or medieval in some way, the demons themselves testify that. And that's just one example. Why is it that the Satanists, when they want to do a black mass, hmm. they have to have a consecrated host? Um, and that, I was going to say that, the reality of that, hmm steps us back to the reality of ordination of a priest mm. who is the person who therefore is the, the conveyor of that blessing that to that metal or to our lives or to the congregation or the, it's not really nice words that what is a blessing you wrote a book on on a spiritual warfare and the, and the importance of that for fighting the spiritual battle what about people watching right now that just, wait a second, that's just a bunch of words. What's a blessing? What goes on in a blessing? In a blessing or an object, or sometimes when we speak of sacramentals, we usually think of objects like blessed crucifixes or scapulars or medals. But blessings themselves are sacramentals. And the rite of exorcism is actually a sacramental. A lot of people don't know that. So th uh, th in a sacramental, the prayers of the church are associated, you might say, connected to either the action, like a blessing over food, or to the object in such a way that it, they help dispose us to receive the power of God in answer to those prayers.
Mm-hmm. And so that's what a, a blessing is to to uh, to bless. You know, literally in in um, from the Latin, the Benedictus is the, to speak good, to speak well. Mm-hmm. And so a, a blessing is something that if we're rightly disposed to to receive it, is the the very power of God made possible through the prayers of the church. So that metal that's been blessed has a, a certain aspect of grace. Exactly. It's it's not accompanying that. It's, yeah, that I mean, you know, obviously it doesn't convey the grace the way a sacrament does. Right. But the way I like to put it is we speak sometimes of an occasion of sin where you come close to the place where sin is is likely, you know. I like to speak of them as occasions of grace. Through the church's prayer, the grace is present there now with that sacramental. And if you dispose yourself rightly, it becomes an occasion of grace for you to receive the grace in response to the prayers of the church. Would, would you argue then that, uh, I didn't run this by him before the show, so I'm you know, putting him on it. Would you argue then that if a person <coughs> prays the rosary, that there's a certain occasion for grace for someone that prays it with a blessed rosary versus someone that does it like me with his fingers when he's out running? That's a good point. The, anyway, in some ways, the prayer itself, of course, has the power. Right. As the, so there's a difference between that and just having a piece of metal or a piece of metal that has been blessed so that the prayers of the church are associated with it. Um, but with a rosary, I guess the difference would be that you are actually praying. Yeah. So whether you're doing it with your fingers or you know, when I'm driving, I do the same with my right. fingers. Yeah. But the, the rosary itself, the beads that have been blessed, you know, they could be hanging in your teenager's room on the wall or on a table. And there can actually be an occasion of grace. It's not magic. It's not superstition. Yeah, yeah. for those that are outside the Catholic Church, that's something so foreign to them. That it they, seems, it, yeah, it, yeah. But, but that was just the interesting thing, too. And you being historical theology, how have we gotten so far to the place that for those outside the church, something like we're talking about just seems so absolutely foreign to them? What happened at when, historically, that the whole idea of this, which has a historic... It goes back to uh, the woman with the hemorrhage touching the hem mm-hmm. of Jesus' mm-hmm. garment. Mm-hmm. I mean, it goes back to or them touching the garment of Peter or being in the shadow. I mean, the, there's a long the history of, of it. The, 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 even Old Testament, the, you know, the bones of Elijah, the relics. The, I mean, Elisha, the relics. Um, I think there were, t- you know, some of the things that Martin Luther set in motion uh, were began to desacramentalize Christian understanding for the folks who followed his direction. Um, because you, if you, now he, obviously, obviously there were problems in the church that he was, he was up against and he was yeah. becoming disillusioned with it. But uh, if you become totally disillusioned then with the, the people altogether who, who are, God is using one way or another to bring the grace, you can take yourself away from the occasion of grace. And, I think the Enlightenment, you know, naturally, naturally was kind of an outgrowth of that eventually. And in the Enlightenment, there was a, you know, resistance to anything that was mystery, anything that was beyond kind of matter and energy that suggested that God is actually involved in the life of the world. And uh, if there's going to be any religion left after that at all, it would have to have been something like deism, as it was, mm-hmm. saying there's a God, but he's not involved in our lives. He just set things in motion, and now he, there's no miracles, there's no sacraments there's no nothing like that and so here we are you know 10 or more generations away from that and of generation after generation we have a whole a huge population of non-catholic christians that the whole idea that objects can be sacraments or sacramentals and, and uh, be conveyors of grace and be not only uh, uh, other things that can draw us to god mm-hmm. but the very things in yeah. baptism and Eucharist that God has given us as the primary channels of grace to unite us yeah. to Christ. Except the Pentecostals. Except they have the, prayer cloths. Okay. They, they, do, they lay, lay hands on, they see the body as the channel. I mean, all this, again, that's part of what awakened to my imagination to say, you know, these things, they're real. I saw, saw these things happening. So I, I just want to say, too, that um, Chesterton, G.K. Chesterton, one of my, our favorite writers, I'm sure, uh, once noted that when when the culture, wider culture, began to throw things out from the Catholic tradition that were important and, and needed, that it would always smuggle something back into the culture in a lower form. Mm-hmm. 
So, for instance, uh, threw out the confessional and eventually had the psychiatrist couch. <laughs> threw out the um, uh, the commune of saints and then got into seances and channeling and trying to contact the dead. And I think uh, you've seen that in the New Age movement especially. I mean, it started a long time ago, but uh, where the, the wider culture has this sense that, yeah, there, there can be the power of God somehow associated or, or divine power mm -hmm. somehow associated with physical objects or even with certain words that that bear that authority. Um, but what they've done is to look in all the wrong places to find that. Yeah, interesting. You throw out sacraments and we have you know, pervasive drugs. Mm -hmm. In other words, something, something that'll change my life. You know, something that'll change my mm -hmm. life. You know, and it's interesting. I always looking for something that will change their life. And it's also interesting given the fact that, you know, after the break, we're going to talk a little bit about what's going on in the church and, and how do we respond to that. But it's interesting you brought up the Reformation 500 years ago. Uh, it wasn't the same exact issues that we're facing today, but there was great problems mm -hmm. in the hierarchy during the late 15th and early 16th century. Um, and one of the problems connected with what we're talking about is that uh, as a result, it seems to me, and you're more historic, historian than I am, but that the, the faith of the average Catholic at the time was very external. Mm -hmm. That you know, their faith consisted of the things they did in Mass or uh, going to see relics or going on pilgrimages or buying indulgences, whatever it was, but maybe because the average person in the pew didn't understand the Latin of what was going on, that their faith wasn't as strong, their internal conversion in general. So what we have in, in reaction to this crisis of the time that can trace its roots back to the leadership is that the response of the reformers was to blame the externals call for the internal conversion, faith alone, but throw out all the externals in the process. And so here we are 500 years later, most of our separate brethren, the externals aren't even important at all. There's none of that. It's all head up, as you're talking about faith. Is that how you look on that time? Is that a simplistic way of looking in back at that time? Or? I think that's certainly a you know, feature of it. You, It's so hard for historians to get at the faith right. of everyday people because they, they didn't write and they didn't read. and. Uh, didn't always leave a lot of uh, evidence for us of, of how they lived their life and thought. Um, and I, I would think it was probably a widespread problem. Yeah. I think there probably were plenty of peasants, you know, living who really did have this kind of, it may not have been a very well-formed faith, but a deep faith in God, and, and there was a great interior experience. Yeah. Um, it's when you're talking about a whole population, you right. know, except to it's do paint with a wide brush. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Well, but the parallels to our own time is that people looking and seeing problems in the church and how do you respond to it? What do you do? How do you respond to that? So looking back 500 years, which was just the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, and here we are today with a, a problems in the church. How do we respond? And maybe that's what we'll, well, after the break, let's talk about that, mm -hmm. especially in relationship to some of the books you've written, Paul. All right? Come back. Welcome back to Journey Home. I'm your host, Marcus Grodi, and our guest is Dr. Paul Thigpen, good friend. And uh, I told you earlier in the program that we're going to uh, just talk a little bit about the struggles that we're going through right now in the church. I am going to admit that uh, this program uh, is not live tonight. Uh, we've had, had to tape it about a month or so before it's broadcast. So, you know, who, who knows what's going to be happening in this in the time in between, so we can't, obviously can't address that. But uh, you're a historian, Paul, and I. what we want to talk about tonight is how do you address a scandal in the church 
uh, especially when it's our leaders. You know, so many of us came into the church, and one of the main issues was the issue of authority. In other words, rather than Bible alone, and my own interpretation, which anyone looking around Christ Christendom recognizes that whenever you have a group of, of Christians that believe all they need is the Bible alone to know what's true, is that we're ending up with thousands of conflicting opinions. And so those by grace that awake recognize, on the one hand, that the Bible is the inspired and fallible word of God, but yet we need the church established as our guide are drawn home to the church. So the issue of authority. But it can be troubling then when we come into the church and we see some of our leaders fail uh, in, in very disturbing ways. And I thought I'm going to ask you historically to talk about that. We're not going to belittle it at all. That's, we want to make sure you understand that that's not what we're saying when we talk historically about scandal in church and how to respond to it. But I want to uh, read an account of somebody talking about scandal in the church from a, a while ago. And then you talk about it. I like putting you on the spot, my good friend. Here's what I read this morning as a part of actually the Office of Readings of Liturgy of the Hours this morning. It was the first reading of Liturgy of the Hours. And it says, For Jerusalem has stumbled and Judah has fallen, because their speech and their deeds are against the Lord, defying his glorious presence. Their partiality witnesses against them. They proclaim their sin like Sodom, and they do not hide it. Woe to them! For they have brought evil upon themselves. Tell the righteous that it shall be well with them, for they shall eat the fruit of their deeds. Woe to the wicked! It shall be ill with them, for what his hands have done shall be done to him. My people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O oh, my people, your leaders mislead you and confuse the course of your paths. That's from the prophet Isaiah. As a historian, Paul, how, how do we respond to the scandal into the church? Well, again, we don't, don't want to minimize it. I think about some of the victims that we've been reading about, the report from Pennsylvania. And I, as a parent, you know, I say, oh, my Lord, how can, how can this be? Um, so there's, there's no way I want to minimize the horror, the pain, that they have, and then in a mildly secondary way, the rest of the church looking at that. I, um, in an odd kind of way, knowing some church history um, brings consolation and threatens consolation to find out that, uh, if not every year or every century, even in the church, but that again and again, just as it was among the, the people of God in the Old Testament, um, in the New Testament, you, you already start having reports of things by St. Paul you know, among the very early Christians that are going on, including sexual immorality. Um, looking at uh, things that led up to what are often called the Dark Ages, people often mistake that to mean the entire Middle Ages, but just a certain particular period leading up to, to the uh, end of the first millennium. Um, reading the writings of St. Catherine of Siena, in which the Lord is speaking to her, Jesus is speaking to her, and we'll call the dialogues and about what's going on behind closed doors among his, uh, his clergy. Um, again and again, to, to see that can be a, a source of great discouragement that yeah. does, does anything ever change. On the other hand, it can be some kind of consolation in that even, even though our situation differs in certain ways from earlier situations, that God still was able to have the faith continue, have the church itself continue. Um, and we have to trust somehow, ultimately, if not until heaven, to bring healing to the ones who have been hurt. And so the, I think the one thing we have to, to, to say is what St. Peter said when things were going rough. And he said to Jesus, Lord, where will we go? If the Lord says, will you leave also? 
And he's talking about the Lord personally, but it's, yeah. it's the same for his church too. I think about the Eucharist. All the things that, that we talked about before, the heavenly Catholic Church, Lord, where would I go for all of that, even if there's this corruption, even if these other things are there? Um, what would it have been like, I wonder sometimes, uh, if you were discipled by the, the apostles, even you know, before the time of Jesus' crucifixion? And what if you had first heard about the gospel and about Christ through Judas, through his preaching? Or even through Peter, and then after those events where he denies the Lord, what, mm. what might your you know, mm. temptation have been to say, this is, a, this is all a, you know, not true, this isn't all that real, and to leave. And maybe there's some who did. But it's from the very beginning, even among our Lord's own apostles. Yeah. And so we have to, uh, I think we have to look at that and say, as, as horrible as it is, as horrifying as it is, as intense as it is, there are certain things that God has given us through the church that we, we need, we depend on. Yeah. And as a people, we have to pray, we have to make sacrifices, we have to purify our own hearts, and and all these ways to make sure that at least at our little corner that the faith is, is continuing and, and that hearts are pure with our children, the ones we know, the people we know. When I think about that Isaiah passage, which was written a few years ago, but it sounds like it's speaking to today. Mm -hmm. I think it does remind you, remind us that biblical prophecy often has an already not yet aspect to it. In other words, there was an earlier time when our Lord used it in fulfillment, but that doesn't necessarily mean it was over. That can point to a future time, and it could be pointing to today in our lives. It could have pointed to a number of times in the church. Uh, so when we, when we hear of that seeming description of our very time, does Isaiah also give us instruction on how we ought to respond? How was Judah or Jerusalem, the Israelites, to respond to what they were told about was going to happen in their lives? What, what instructions do we have for that? How to respond to skin? Purify your hearts, rend your hearts, and not your garment. Um, it's always the, it's the same message that we hear from Our Lady again and again. Repent, do penance, believe again, renew your, your faith in God, your trust in Him. Because I mean, look at the, our Lord's words about the end of the church age, about yeah. what will happen right before He comes again. Now, whether we're in that time now or not, I, who can say? But, yeah. but He talks about things being so bad that if it hadn't been for God's soon intervention, that the the very elect could have been deceived and brought away. Mm -hmm. And so that tells us right there that we should not expect that things are going to be all golden. You know, the danger is that we have bought into a myth, and that is the myth of progress mm -hmm. as a whole culture. And that myth of progress is that the life around us, the world that we live in, is just going to keep getting better. You might see a blip or a you know a problem here or there, but that we're going to live in this great time forever, and that even though we might say every Sunday, I believe in the second coming when we re re recite the creed, few of us, I can't speak for me but myself, but live as if, well, that's way out there, way out there. We won't say it'll never happen in my lifetime, but we live like it. But it seems to me that the early church writers all the early church writers, the New Testament writers, following the lead of our Lord, was calling all of us to live our life as if it could be tomorrow. Right? That, that's about the, the thief in the night. Yes. All of that. He was saying, the, you're not supposed to try and figure out the day. But at the same time, he was saying, but watch and be ready. Because when you read the signs of the times, part of it is, is to remind you that we're only pilgrims here. 
right? I mean, talk more about that. We're only you've you've written about that. You've written about it in your your own uh, rendition of going to hell in uh, in uh, your version of Dante. You've talked about it in your books on spiritual warfare, and you've got your book here, The Burden, which really is a prophetic uh, expression of the time we're in, right? I mean, we, we're, we're to be ready and watchful, uh, like the Old Testament people being ready for when they were going to leave Egypt. You know, part of the, one of the themes we hear again and again from our Lord when he's talking about the really difficult times is do not be deceived. And I think that's another part, in addition to trying to purify ourselves, that he will say again, don't be deceived, don't be misled. Hmm. That's what he says about the elect at the end, that, that they could almost be deceived, taken away. Uh, part of what we have to do is, is recognize that our culture is saying all the wrong things in so many ways with regard to uh, morality, with regard to uh, what it means to, to truly live, to be successful. With, in so many ways, we're getting these messages, and, and we've got the technology that the message becomes ubiquitous. Wherever you turn, it's, it's there, and our children have it in their hands, the palms of their hands. And um, The part of what we have to do is also be diligent in our understanding of what the gospel really is, what Jesus teaches, what the church from the beginning has taught, and not to be deceived, because that uh, the world wants to tell us that certain things are are not sinful after all. They're fine. And out of that kind of acceptance of certain people within the church, we get a great deal of what we're seeing now. They've become confused. They've, it's a loss of faith on the part of those. Some of the things you read about of, that were from Pennsylvania and other places, um, St. Louis, and how you have to ask yourself if they really did have the faith, how could they do that? You, you had written a book 15 years ago addressing the, the scandal in the, in the early yeah. 2002. Uh, what was the name of the book? I've, Shaken by Scandal. Shaken so by it Scandal. Was a collection of essays yeah, yeah. by various people, observers. And, and yeah. interestingly, many of those same people that wrote in your book are the ones that you mm -hmm. read on the, on the internet now. And uh, uh, that might be interesting to reflect on what we were saying back 15 years ago, back today have we improved any was the things cleaned up was this the same issue but also um, I, I seem to remember even Ratzinger back then during that time saying that it's a problem with the issue of faith right it's a yes it's a, do you, do you believe that what the church has taught all along about certain moral issues do you believe that's true do you believe that if you're a priest that you are a spiritual father if you're a bishop that you're a spiritual father um, do you believe our Lord Jesus Christ when he says, better that you have a millstone hung around your neck and be thrown in the depths of the sea than for you to cause one of these little ones to stumble? Do you believe that or not? And if you, if you do believe it, how could you do these things? Well, you weren't of the same Protestant tradition I was. I was of more of the once saved, always saved group. Uh, and the problem with that, though, I don't think any of those leaders would have, have uh, promoted this idea. But one of the sad things out of that movement is if, if, if it really doesn't matter how I live, there's a security there, mm -hmm. you know, a, a, presum a presumption that when I stand, if I died tonight and stood before God and he should ask me why he should let me into his kingdom, well, I'll just point to Jesus and I accepted him as my Lord and Savior and so therefore I'm covered with his righteousness and God doesn't see my filth. Um, but that could lead to at least undercutting uh, a real motive mm -hmm. for cleaning up one's life. Is there a similar presumption in Catholicism that could lead people to think, eh, in the end, it really doesn't matter how I live my life. I'm wondering, you know, I try to understand mm. how certain people could look themselves in the mirror, but do they have a presumption about who they are or what they've accomplished or maybe how many sacraments they've received that somehow gives them the impression that, you know, it's not going to matter? Well, I think um, in certain Catholic circles, there have been, there's been uh, 
and focus on mercy to the exclusion of justice. Um, that's uh, so one, one symptom of that is to, to go to a Catholic funeral and to hear the eulogy and everyone talking, so, oh, he's in heaven now and all that, and no thought of praying for him because he might have to be purged or something. I mean, that's just one little example of it, of, of people taking the attitude that, oh, it's all over with now. There's, there's nothing to be fixed or cleaned up. He's going, going straight to heaven, um, which, of course, is not what the church has taught <laughs> all along. It's not the reality, only in certain cases that, that someone would. And so it uh, seems to me an, an emphasis on mercy without also talking about justice. Um, you get other versions of it. People say, well, I went to confession, so I don't have to worry about that now. Um, when actually <laughs> there's got to be a, an attempt to reform your life that's a part of that whole sacrament. Confession isn't merely just the words that come out and yeah. the words that come from the priest. It's what's going on in your heart, right? And you can, you can dispose yourself in such a way that you're basically spurning the grace that comes to you through the sacrament. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm careful how I say that, but it's right. uh, so much that it, it's kind of an, it's what Dietrich Bonhoeffer, what our separated brethren, you know, theologian once called cheap, cheap grace. grace. Yeah, this notion that, and, and some Catholics have it as well. Uh -huh. um, I've, and the, the book that I did on, on uh, set in hell, uh, my visit to hell, the, the quote I have on the, you know, the, the page in the beginning is, hell is the final guarantee that what we do matters. Hell is the final guarantee that what we do matters. And some of the things I've been reading lately, these folks, I say, do they, have they, have they lost their, their, faith, their, their, their faith that hell exists? That there's anything that they do really matters? And do they not believe in judgment? And I've, I mean, I've got things to repent of in my own life, of course. We yeah. all do, so I'm not trying to be self-righteous about it. But sooner or later, you have to wonder how much this is, contributes to the problem of people who don't have faith. They don't have faith that God is God of justice as well as mercy. They don't have faith that there is a judgment day. They don't have faith. You know, I remember um, a... And we need to be careful here. We're not, it's not like we got a bucket here full of stones, right. like we got right, right to throw right. on, on yeah. Jesus. But I do remember when I was studying the English Puritans that there was a writer by the name of Richard Baxter who was a, a you know, and he yeah. wrote a book called The Reformed Pastor, which was written in 1650. And I think it was 1650. Uh, and for the longest time during the 19th century, it was required reading for every, at least Protestant. Anglican seminarian because he said in 1650 so the Anglican church had been around for a hundred years uh, he said in there it's a sin when a man becomes a pastor before he's a Christian and you know again we're not pointing fingers and casting stones but I mean the reality is we need to pray for our leaders who've who've, uh, as Paul says in 1 Timothy 3, desired to be a bishop, desired to be a priest, uh, and through the work of God's grace, they were given the mantle and have accepted responsibility unto themselves to be witnesses of Christ. And we need to pray desperately for them because they will stand before God with great accountability, right? For what they've accepted for their responsibility. Again, we're not pointing fingers because if we're, if you and I are Christians, we've done the same. We've done the same. We've accepted the name of Christ to be his witness. And so, you know, uh, what kind of witnesses are? I was reminded of another scripture here that I wanted you to reflect on. Um, and of course, there's been a development about this scripture. Because Jesus one time talked about there being a very wide door and a very narrow door. And he talked about the majority of people are going to go through the wide door. But, you know, there's, there's a, a narrow, a very narrow door. But there's been a development in that. Because over the years, theologically, we've widened that narrow door a lot, haven't we? So that there's just a whole lot more. That little narrow door isn't narrow anymore. It's really, really wide. Paul talk about that. Have we widened that door? You know what I mean? It, 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 as Paul warned against, 
in um, Romans 12 that we aren't to um, surrender to culture or to transform by the renewal of Christ. You know, have we, not officially, but has that door been widened, at least in the eyes of so many? Yeah, I certainly think so. And I wouldn't call it a development necessarily. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it may be a contradiction in some ways to what's gone before. We, uh, the church teaches, and I'm happy to, to agree that, that in the case of any individual, we don't, we don't know. You know we, we pray for them even after they're deceased and leave them in God's hands. But the, I think the part we have to focus on there is the first part of the statement. Now, the second part is about, you know, few enter or, or many enter. But the first part of the statement is narrow is the way that leads. And so we have to look at our own hearts and, and say, okay, am I taking the narrow way? That means that it, there'll be a lot of things that are ruled out for me. There'll be a lot of things that I can't do. And that sounds negative. But in the end, it's not negative because what lies on the other side of that door is glory. So you had mentioned earlier uh, that one of the warnings of the end, uh, and again, we're, we are to live our lives as if we could face our Lord tonight. But one of the warnings of the end is that there would be great deception amongst the people, um, amongst the faithful, amongst the remnant, they'd be tempted. How do we make sure that our children and ourselves if we want to be a faithful remnant, how do we protect ourselves from being deceived? How do we make sure that we are, are, are doing what we need to by grace to enter that narrow gate and that we haven't been deceived into thinking that gate is very, very, very wide? Well, as an historical theologian and a church historian, this will sound like an obvious answer for me, but I... C.S. Lewis, you know, great Christian writer, once said that for every contemporary book he read, he would read two books by, from a previous generation. And, and for those of us who can, who have, and the access, you've got it on the internet, to, to spend time reading what the church has always taught, things from previous generations. Our generation has all kinds of blind spots. And because we live in it, we're not likely to see those blind spots when we're, when we're reading them. But to be deep in Scripture... But also to, you know, gosh, take a look at the Baltimore Catechism. Yeah. You know? <laughs> take a look at some of the, the, the great works. And they're not Faith all of the Fathers by Cardinal yeah, Gibbons. Yeah. Awesome yeah. book. Yeah. Uh, to see what, what is permanent and what is the kind of fluff that's being offered now sometimes of things that are, are said in very vague ways that could be misunderstood. Sometimes you wonder if, you know, someone's saying in order to deceive. Um, to, to find your way to those sources that are perennial, that have always been, have been there a long time and stood the test of time, and to, to teach children to do the same. Yeah, yeah and I, I know that, um, that even a part of this confusing time for many people is our Holy Father's uh, challenging of a statement in the Catechism, you know, and that's a bit debated. But other than that issue, uh, I still feel very confident that the Catechism is a great source of, if you want to know how not to be deceived, you, follow, you read the Catechism. Uh, you, you read the Catechism uh, to hear what, because the Catechism pulls in from Scripture and pulls in for the Church Fathers and puts it into a wonderful way to understand this is, uh, this is the deposit of faith. This is how we understand what, what the Church is. Uh, a minute ago, and it's not a lot of time, Paul, you also again wrote uh, about being a, being careful of spiritual, the spiritual battle. You've got a wonderful mm -hmm. book on spiritual warfare. Just a couple seconds. Uh, how about helping the people know what to do to make sure not only being deceived by bad teachers, but that they're listening to the Holy Spirit? In the book, I'll just say there, there are sections about what our armor is. St. Paul talks about our spiritual armor. Uh, what are our weapons? Um, and so we, we hold fast to the scripture, to prayer, to the sacraments, sacramentals we've been given, fasting, kind of all the traditional spiritual disciplines and means of grace that we know we have. 
not to neglect them. And then the armor actually is, is the virtues. That if uh, we develop the virtues, then those fiery darts that come from the enemy that St. Paul talks about, they'll hit the armor and fall down. If the enemy tempts us to pride and we've developed humility, it's not going to touch us, uh, for example. So those are, you know, you can look at the book for, for more details, but all the classic spiritual disciplines that the church has given us. Paul. Thank you so much for joining us again. Marcus, God bless you and all, all your viewers. Okay, again. thank you very much. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Journey Home. God bless you.